said that proper communication is listening twice as much as we speak. Sometimes I think we all can say that we speak more than what we listen. You know, communication is so important in our daily lives. Communication is the imparting or exchanging of information or news. It means the sending or receiving of information. And without clear communication, without that clear, clear communication, there would be problems in our homes, problems in our jobs, and even as we, in really in any aspect of our, our life that we walk in. So I can say that clear communication is very vital in our life. As a preacher, I must have clear communication or communicate clearly to you, the, li the listener, of lessons that, uh, that I have put together so that they're clear, precise, and that we can understand. And to understand what God intends for us to, to learn from them. And if we think about it, in our communication, there is an audience, one or more, that is listening to what is being said. And if the communication is not clear, then the work, if it's work related, the work cannot be performed. Or if it is performed, it's not performed adequately. Where it comes to spirit, spirituality, one can't be saved according to the scriptures. Where it comes to the Christian life, one cannot live pleasing to God. But what about communication with God? You know, we know that we've got to have clear communication with one another and with, and with what we do. Do we need clear communication? in our prayer life to God? Do we need to have clear communication with God or does God understand our needs? Look at Romans chapter 8. Beginning in verse 27, we're told there, or 26 actually, the, we're told there in Scripture that the Spirit helps in our weaknesses. For we don't know what to pray as we ought. But the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Of course, we see here that... Uh, the Holy Spirit in makes intercession for us in our prayer life to God. But also, uh, Jesus does too. Jesus also makes intercession for us. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 34. Because there we, we see the very fact that Jesus also makes intercessions for us. Who is He that condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen and is even at the right hand of God who also makes intercessions for us. So we see that the Holy Spirit and Jesus makes intercessions for us. But when we get back to our prayer life, when we get back to praying, how is our prayer life? You know, in Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 9, Jesus is teaching His disciples how to pray. And there's a lot of things that we can learn from this prayer. Notice the prayer that Jesus taught. 
Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also forgive, have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you will forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you of you, uh, uh, your trespasses. Prayer is something that must be learned. And, and that's maybe the reason why that the disciples asked Jesus to teach them how to pray. I can remember many of a night that Nancy would be in the bedroom with Stephen and, uh, and Jessica teaching them how to pray and helping them pray their, their bed prayers before they went to bed at night. And I'm grateful that she did this. And in our own personal prayer life, we, you know, sometimes I just don't know what to pray. And I'm grateful that God understands and knows what I'm saying. I don't have to worry about making a mistake in my prayer life to God because He understands and He knows. So tonight, I want us to consider the who and the what in our prayer life. Now, when we talk about the who and... I'm sorry, I forgot about who and this. The who and the what of the prayer life is, is God... Approach, uh, approachable. In other words, can we approach God in our prayer life? Now, there was a time when, that God was unapproachable. As a matter of fact, in Exodus chapter 26 and verses 31 and through, I think, like 35, uh, the veil that's going up in the temple between the holy place and the most holy place was being described and, and uh, the children of Israel were told how to make it, what to make it out of and all this. Well, what was the difference between the holy place and the, and the most holy place? Well, one place was for the, the Ark of the Covenant, for the mercy seat. And that's where God would come down once a year and only the priest was allowed to go into there one time in a year. In Exodus chapter 19, in verse 12, there was another time that God was not able to be approached. Uh, God was going to come down, and he, he told Moses to have everybody come to the mountain, to the foot of the mountain, and he would, he would come down and, and he would address the people. And when God did this, when, the, when the, the, the clouds came down and there was lightnings and there was all sorts of things, the people were fearful and they asked not for God to ever uh, approach them again but to talk to them through Moses. But these people were told, don't even touch the mountain. Look at verse 12. God told Moses to set limits for the people all around, saying, Take care not to go up uh, into the mountain or touch the edge of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall be put to death. If we have a loving God and a caring God, why would God not want to be approachable here? Well, let's go on with this thought. Because God could be approached by prayer then and even now. We're going to look at several texts here. Look at Psalm 18.6. In my stress I called upon the Lord. To my God I cried from hell. From His temple He heard my voice. My cry to Him reached His ears. The psalmist was praying to God. In Psalm 145, actually verse 17 and 18, the Lord is righteous in all His ways and kind in all His works. The Lord is near to all who call on Him and to all call on Him in truth. 
In Psalm 50, in verse 15, the psalmist writes, I, And call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me, God says. But in verse 16, But to the wicked, God says, What right have you to recite my statutes, or take up my covenant on your lips? For you hate discipline, and you cast my words behind you. If you see a thief, you are pleased with him. And you keep company with adulterers. God is letting everyone know, or letting us know, that, that the wicked doesn't have a right to approach God in prayer. In Psalm 91 and verse 15, He holds fast to me in love. I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. When we pray to God, God will answer. We're talking about communication with God. So we see that God can be approached through prayer. Communication with God is really a blessing. And the blessing is only set aside for the Christian. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 18, we're told, Therefore through Him, speaking of Christ, we have access both in one spirit to the Father. And in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, we're told there to pray without ceasing. So, this is the who and the what of the prayer life. We're communicating our desires, our wishes, our wants to our Heavenly Father. And He can be approached through prayer. But there are elements to prayer, and we can also see those elements in the... the uh, the model prayer that Jesus taught His disciples. In that model prayer that we read just a few moments ago, here are the elements of that prayer. There's love and praise. So we are to love our God and to praise our God. There's thanksgiving in that. There's recognition who God is, the Holy One. There is the recognition or the, the, the statement of other person's needs. And then we see there's without ceasing or with ceasing uh, in the prayer life. We see there's humbleness in this prayer. So we see here are the elements of this prayer life. Now, there are several texts that we can look at with each one of these items here. But we're going to look at one out of each. When we look about the love and the praise... David wrote in Psalm 34, 1, when he changed his behavior before Emily, so he drove him out and he went away. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. So we see the love and the praise aspect of it in David's prayer in Psalm chapter 34, verse 1. And for Thanksgiving, when we see this idea in Isaiah chapter 12 and verse 1, where Isaiah record, records, You will say in that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, for though you were angry with me, your anger turned away that you might comfort me. Well, while ago, we had the privilege to address our Heavenly Father in prayer, be led in prayer by Anthony. And many times in his prayer, he thanked God for certain things, for the blessings that we receive, for, for living in the land that we do, and for, you know, even for God hearing our prayer. So every prayer I have ever heard uttered from this, this stage, there's always been these elements in it, and thanksgiving is one of them. They were in this the model prayer, there's a recognition of God. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 26 and verse 15. Look down from your holy habitation from the heavens. Bless your people Israel and the ground that you have, that you have given us, as you swore to our fathers, a land flowing with milk and honey. Here this, in this prayer, this prayer is, is asking for God to bless Israel for the land and for the land that God had already promised to them. So there's the, the, 
in the model prayer, we see the need for, uh, for other people's needs, but every, there are several places in Scripture where we see even Paul. In Paul's letters, the, his epistles that he wrote, many times you'll see in those epistles, I cease not to pray for you and for your needs. So, in our prayer life, our communication, we need to pray to God for other people's uh, needs. We need to pray without ceasing. In Deuteronomy chapter 9 and verse 18, the writer here, or Moses is writing this, and he says, I lay prostrate before the Lord as before, forty days and forty nights. I neither ate bread nor drank water because of all the sin that you committed, and doing what was evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. For forty days and forty nights, Moses prayed to God on behalf of the people. Have you ever prayed that long? He did it without eating or drinking. But we pray with humbleness. And that's what we see in the model prayer. We see that humbleness. In 2 Chronicles 7, 14, If my people who are called by thy name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Notice what God said that the people must do in order to be forgiven of their sin. First, they had to humble themselves. Then they had to pray. Then they had to seek God. Then they had to turn from their wicked ways. And only when all these things were taken place, had taken place, God said, I will hear from heaven. And then, and only then, I will forgive your sin and heal the land. So humbleness. We need to be humble. So, where is it? that we pray. The who and what of my, my prayer life is where do I pray? Where do you go to pray? I know that Nancy prays and, and this scares me. She prays on the way to work in the car. Now, not long ago, as she was driving to work, she had a very close call. Somebody had pulled out and it was, it was very close. She could have been in a serious accident. And she called and told me about it. She said, but I was praying. Okay. That's why I don't like you praying while you're driving. <laughs> but with that prayer life, I'm sure, you know, God was with her. God helped her. And so God, that's just one of the blessings that we get. But where do you pray to God? Do you have a favorite place that you like to go and, and, and to pray? You know, as a congregation, we pray together to God. As a family, we pray together uh, to God for our meals and, and family emotions and such. But how about your private prayers to God? Where do you pray to Him? While the New Testament does not tell us of any particular location, that we should pray to God, Jesus did suggest some places. And we see it through His prayer life. Did He not pray from a mountaintop? How about a beach? How about working in the yard? In Matthew chapter 26, actually, let's, let's look at that. Go to Matthew chapter 26 and verse 36. Matthew chapter 26, beginning in verse 36 and going through verse 44, we see the prayer of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. His life is coming to an end. And in, in His prayer, that the one thing, phrase that, that, Jesus always, uh, that Jesus said was, Not my will, but your will be done. Now, Jesus was all alone when He was praying this prayer. He did take three of His disciples with Him. And He left them at a certain point and He went further to pray. 
So he was all alone praying. Not my will, God, but your will be done. In Matthew chapter 6, in verse 6, Jesus makes this suggestion to us. When you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is, seen, who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. <clears throat> I am not suggesting that God is telling us that we must pray in a room by ourselves with the door shut. I'm not suggesting that at all. However, our prayer life should be very personal between us and God. Our, our prayer life should not be something that should bring attention to us when we pray in public, like such as when you go and you have a meal together with your family in a restaurant. You don't pray to be seen of men. You bow your head, you can speak lowly where it's not disturbing anyone. And you know, I, I have started to notice that there are more and more families praying as they're about to eat a meal in restaurants. And that really is, is uh, uh, nice to see. Also, Jesus prayed in the wilderness. In Mark chapter 1, verse 35, and Luke chapter 5, verse 16, uh, we see that he rose very early in the morning and while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place and there he prayed. As I, as I said a while ago in Luke chapter 6 and verse 12, on a mountaintop, Jesus prayed. Isaiah chapter 38 and verse 2, uh, 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 Hezekiah, King Hezekiah, prayed from his bed. Notice this prayer. Beginning in verse 1. In those days Hezekiah became sick and at a point of death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Asmon, came to him and said, Thus says the Lord, set your house in order, for you shall die, you shall not recover. You know, I think some people would like to be told when they're about to die. Well, Hezekiah was told, you're about to die. But then Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord. Hezekiah didn't pray with uh, uh, Isaiah there where Isaiah could see. He turned his head to the wall. He prayed to the Lord. And notice this prayer. Please, Lord, remember me. Or remember how I walked before you in faithfulness with a whole heart and have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly in the prayer. Then the word of the Lord came to Isaiah. Go and say to Hezekiah, Thus says the Lord, the God of your David, your father, I have heard your prayer, I have seen your tears. Behold, I will add 15 years to your life. I will deliver your, you and the city out of the hand of, of the king of Assyria and will defend this city. This shall be a sign to you from the Lord that the Lord will do this thing that, is, that he has promised. Behold, I will make a, the shadow cast by declining on the sundial of Ahaz turn back ten steps. So the sun turned back on the dial ten steps which it had declined. Not only did God say, I'm going to answer your prayer, here is the proof of my promise. Even though that we, we see this, it is interesting to me that Hezekiah went to God in prayer with nobody looking. And he cried. Have you ever cried when you prayed? I have. And there have been times I'm with tears in my eyes saying, Lord, I just don't know what to say. I, I don't know how to put it in words. The grief that I'm feeling, the, the things that I'm experiencing, I just don't know what to say, God. But I can have the comfort, as we already seen, is that, that the Holy Spirit and Jesus has taken that prayer to God. And here Hezekiah is, is praying, he's weeping, asking for this death to pass over him. 
And no doubt that prayer touched God because God said, I'm going to give you 15 years extra. And so that you'll know, I'm going to, I'm going to show you by this sundial. I'm going to let you, I'm making a promise to you and I'm going to prove my promise by declining the sun. Ten steps. On the cross, in Luke chapter 23, verses 33 and 34, Jesus, in verse 34, prays to God. He says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, and they cast lots to divide His garments. So, Jesus prayed from the cross. How about in a home? In Acts chapter 1, in several places, in verse 14, in verse 24, in Acts chapter 12, in verse 12, mentions several places that in a home that was that people have prayed. In Acts chapter 10, in verse 9, we see that, that there was someone that prayed from, a, uh, from the rooftop. We see in Acts chapter 16, in verse 25, that, that Peter, uh, that Paul, there were two apostles there that prayed from prison. In Acts chapter 21 and verse 5, we see, we see people that were praying from a beach. In uh, Jonah chapter 2, verses 1 through 9, we see Jonah praying from the belly of a whale. Each time, God heard the prayers. Location is sometimes important so that our thoughts can remain focused. Have you ever been praying and drifted off to sleep? To me, that's the, that's the greatest way to fall asleep is talking to God. Somebody asked me once, do you think God heard my prayer because I fell asleep? Most assuredly. If you have a praying relationship with God, God heard that prayer. But you were feeling so at ease in that prayer that you just drifted on. Wouldn't it, I'm not going to say be nice, but if you knew that you were about to take your final breath, wouldn't it be great to spend that last few minutes with your family praying to God? Together. Location is not important when it comes to prayer life, but spiritual spiritual condition is. So the who and what of a prayer life depends on the heart. In Luke, or uh, not Luke, <laughs> yeah, Luke chapter eighteen and verse thirteen, we see the example of a, a tax collector who is beating his, his chest. And he's, he's praying to God. He says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He's, he won't even look up into heaven, the Scripture says. You know, that proves to me that heart is important when we pray to God. The life of the Christian depends on their heart. And mo a lot of my sermons, I like to bring the heart condition in because if our heart is not in serving God, if our heart is not in the praying of God uh, then our heart is not in to living the Christian life and, and we're not going to do it we may feel like we have to do something instead of wanting to do it for what God has done for us but in our prayer life sometimes our heart sometimes our heart may be very heavy when I was diagnosed with cancer, my first prayer to God after that, I was by myself in, in my office. And I prayed to God with a heavy heart. I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know how I was going to deal with anything. And that's why I was asking God to help me with it. My prayers sometimes today are heavy because of the shape of that our world is in. I believe it was Anthony that prayed just a few minutes ago for our congregation and for the work that we need to do. All this
this has got to come from our heart. And when we pray, our heart may sometimes have sadness in it. Daniel prayed with sadness over Israel in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 6. As we already looked at, the, the tax collector uh, prayed with uh, a heaviness of heart when he was, he wouldn't even look up into heaven. He knew the, type, the condition of his life and he was praying to God. Hannah, in 1 Samuel chapter uh, uh, 18 and verse 13, no, 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 for, uh, chapter 1 verses 9 through 11, that's what it is. Uh, Hannah was praying, she was weeping, wasn't she? She was weeping because she wanted a child. And as a matter of fact, the priest saw Hannah saying her prayer. She was wording the prayer with her mouth without a voice. And, and, and he thought she was drunk. She said, I'm not drunk. And she told the, uh, the, the priest what, you know, what she was praying for. And he told her, your prayer will be answered. However, sometimes we pray from a heart of joy. And even in the heart of joy, we, we sometimes will have tears, tears of joy. We have joy that the sick that we prayed for has recovered. Wasn't it great to see uh, Jeanette here this morning? Wasn't it great to see Hoover here this morning? When we have been praying for individuals that have been sick for such a long time and we see them come into the building, isn't it great to see this? And we're joyful with it. David prayed with joy in Psalm chapter 63 in verse 5 and 6. In, in this text, David says, My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips when I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. For you have been my help in the shadow of your wings. I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. Paul prayed because of faithfulness of other Christians in Colossians chapter 1, verses 3 through 8. And I said a while ago that there are a lot of times that Paul in his epistles made mention that he prayed for them. This is one of those epistles. But in verse 3 of Colossians 1, Paul writes, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith, so, we pray for others because of their, their faithfulness. If we have a heavy heart, we pray. If we have a joyful heart, we need to pray. Communication to God is what God wants from you and I. Yes, even when we don't know how or what to say, God understands. He watched His Son hang on the cross. He watched His Son die on the cross. He heard His Son say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Communication with God is so vital for the Christian. It is a blessing that we, that we have from God. And it could be that we have taken our prayer life for granted it could be that we need to be reminded about who and what we are praying to and, and for. It may be that we've gotten the elements of, of a prayer life. We have forgotten them, really. It may be that we need to find a place of quietness to pray. But the heart is so important. When the heart is sad, pray. When the heart is happy, Pray. But have a heart. <clears throat> have that spiritual condition <clears throat> that God will hear your prayer. It is so vital and so great that God has made it a way for us to communicate to Him. Where would we be if we didn't have the ability to go to our Heavenly Father in prayer? Where would we be if 
we were sitting there all alone, receiving bad news and there was no one to talk to. We couldn't even talk to our Heavenly Father. Because we didn't know how to pray, because we knew we didn't, weren't in a condition to pray, our soul condition. You see, if we need to get our life right to where God will hear our prayer, that's what we need to do. Communication with God is something that we all need. And maybe we need to have a what they used to call a prayer service. I remember people calling Wednesday night prayer service. Maybe we need to do that again. Do we believe in prayer? Do we trust prayer? Do we trust our communication with God? I hope we do. I hope that you pray to God on a, on a constant basis. I hope that you pray for this congregation. I hope you pray for our elders. I hope you pray for our members. I hope you pray for the members that are that are hit and miss, hot and cold. I hope that you pray for them that that they will return. I hope you pray that we will grow, first of all, in knowledge. And when we pray in knowledge, I pray to grow in knowledge, and when we grow in knowledge, I promise you, friends, we will grow in number. But we've got to start with prayer. Maybe there's someone here tonight that needs to respond to the invitation. Maybe someone needs to respond and say, I have I want a better prayer life with God. I, I, I want to have a prayer life with God. And right now I know He won't hear my prayer. And maybe there's someone that wants to put Christ on in baptism and have their sins washed away. Whatever it is, we're here. We're here. We are here. So if you need to respond, come now. As together we stand and sing.